Tony Blair as the longest serving Labour Prime Minister in British history. Throughout most of those years in power, Alistair Campbell was the other man in the room. Privy to Blair's innermost thoughts, ambitions and doubts. He occupied a position of unequalled authority and influence. He kept a diary recording the good days and the bad, the peaks and troughs of political power. Tony said they know I'm Labour and want to change things. They believe things should pretty much stay the same. We looked shifty and shabby. It was a disaster and getting worse. We were in danger of being seen as a soap opera and not a government. Tony said we have to hold our nerve and have balls of steel. In the early hours of this morning, Blair and Campbell awoken with the news that Princess Diana, who they were both fond of, has been fatally injured in a car crash in Paris. We had I don't know how many conversations. We went round and round in circles about what he should say and also how. Just after seven, Tony called again. He'd been working on the words for his doorstep and going over some lines he'd drafted. We agreed that it was fine to be emotional and to call her the People's Princess. Talk about the good she did. He kept saying, I can't really believe this has happened. The people everywhere, not just here in Britain, everywhere, they kept faith with Princess Diana. They liked her, they loved her. They regarded her as one of the people. She was the people's princess. This was also going to be a test for him, the first time in which the country had looked to him in a moment of shock and grief. Waiting to one side are the Prime Minister, the Defence Secretary. The mood was a bit edgy. I sensed their concerns about where all this was going. Prince Charles talking to the Prime Minister, who spoke so movingly this morning, of the people's princess who will stay in her hearts forever. I was hovering near Tony as he chatted to the Lord Chamberlain, and they called me over. The Lord Chamberlain was clear this was an extraordinary situation, and they would find it useful if we could be involved in the discussions about this. Tony volunteered me for the next few days and said we would do whatever they asked of us. Afterwards, Tony set off for checkers. He called me from the car and said it was clear they didn't really know what had hit them and genuinely wanted help and support. The Herald Tribune's headline was World Mourns the People's Princess. The phrase had really taken hold and was becoming part of the language. We have to be careful that it doesn't look like we're writing our script rather than hers. I think it must be very, very cold-hearted not to have a flag up. I think it's a disgrace on the whole royal family. They had clearly put to the Queen the issue of lowering the flag, but it was a broken tradition too far. The palace press team kept me back after the Lord Chamberlain's morning meeting and said they had a real fear this was becoming the people against the family. I walked back through the park, flowers everywhere. It was heaving with people yet quiet. I talked to a group of five youngish people, three men and two women, who had come up from Croydon. It was as if they knew her, like there was some kind of intimate bond. 
I couldn't work out if it was all about her or all about them, or all about a desire for a new way of doing things. Heaven knows what she would have made of it. She knew she touched people, but she can't ever have imagined this. I think it's disgusting that they have not appeared or said a word relating to all this. The royal family responded to the wave of public emotion following the death of the Princess of Wales. There was hurt at suggestions that the family was indifferent to the nation's sorrow. The mood was really turning against the royals and everyone seemed helpless in the face of it. It was pretty clear that Prince William really felt strongly about the role of the media vis-a-vis -vis his mother and would not want to be doing anything that he felt was for them. I was constantly pushing the line that the palace were very much in the driving seat and we were there with help and support. Someone is prodding and cajoling uh, the palace into making concessions and I think that someone can only be Downing Street. We were never that far away from an interference, politicisation, exploitation line and we had to stay the right side of the line. In truth, they had delegated a lot of the judgment on this to Tony, and he to me. The Queen had agreed to do a broadcast, and she and the Queen Mum and the boys would visit the palaces and Chapel Royal. I suggested the visits might involve talking to people in the crowds. In another unique break with protocol, the Union flag will fly at half-mast from Buckingham Palace during the funeral and until midnight on Saturday. The afternoon could not have gone better for them. As the Queen walked around in front of the palace looking at flowers and talking to people, you could sense the pressure lifting, the mood changing. The broadcast script was fine. Since last Sunday's dreadful news, we have seen throughout Britain and around the world an overwhelming expression of sadness at Diana's death. Tony wanted her to say she was speaking from the heart. I persuaded them to put in speaking as a grandmother. So what I say to you now, as your queen and as a grandmother, I say from my heart. The route had to be long to let the crowd see the cortege pass, but that created extra policing problems and also meant if the princess followed, it was a very long walk. I asked if there were any religious or protocol reasons why, if the coffin was followed, it had to be followed the whole way. There were gasps around the table, then pennies dropped all round. It could go from Kensington Palace. Problem solved. It felt very odd watching it all on TV. I felt very remote from it. Yet I also felt a sense of authorship. I would like to end by thanking God for the small mercies he's shown us at this dreadful time. The main event for me though was Charles Spencer with his barbs at the press and the royal family. As soon as TB came back, he asked me to see him, even though he had a stack of kings and queens coming for lunch. Hillary Clinton joined us, and Tony asked her how she thought we should respond to Spencer. She said we shouldn't be rushed into anything. This was not a legislation thing. His attack on the royals would be the bigger story. Tony Blair spoke with the Queen about the events surrounding Diana's death and the lessons that might be drawn from them. He said conversation was not that easy. They don't know what to make of me. They think I helped, but they also wonder whether my calling her the People's Princess didn't fuel the public feeling. They know I'm not left-wing, but they also know I'm Labour and want to change things. 